So for today, I have this uh, Jurgensen style uh, movement, and um, this is very interesting. This has uh, several parts which have patent dates, and we see on the balance staff uh, a patent date, and on this wheel here, uh, also a patent date. And we have both, uh, it's interesting that there's the the entire uh, the day and dates, but we, these are both from 1868 and 1869. And this is, uh, on the dial we see that it's signed Montenden Frere's Locla. Now, uh, I would like to uh, remove these uh, hands and remove the dial to look on the reverse side of the dial and also on the movement to determine uh, what the movement number is. Uh, it is very fortunate that we have these uh, parts which have patent dates on there. And in, in, in uh, determining the serial number for this piece, uh, we have this very precise dating that we're probably looking at a date of fabrication uh, after or from 1869, but probably 1869, 1870 uh, window here. So knowing the serial number, well, this will give us very precise um, uh, dating sequence uh, to be compared with other uh, Montana and Frere's Locla uh, serial numbers. And this serialization is very interesting that in uh, this is evident as early as the 1830s uh, that the serial number of the movement was also the facteur the, or the invoice number. So they were selling these watches based on the serial numbers. Uh, and this was always recorded in sales. So, But let us proceed and find out uh, what lurks under the dial. So I was uh, able to very easily and very quickly uh, remove the hour, minute, and second uh, hands. And I did that very gingerly with uh, placing this on top, this plastic uh, screen, and then slightly lifting with this tool. And for this, the smaller edge and I was very fortunate in getting these off. So let us proceed to the next step and that will be turning this around. And there are two screws uh, which have a half uh, or a crescent moon, um, which need to be in, in the correct position in order to release the dial feed. So that'll be the next step. So this is the reverse side of the movement. This is a Jurgensen style movement. And this is very uh, typical from this 18, 65 1870 period now uh, we have two screws here with this half moon these will uh, need to be shifted in such a way so that they free the um, uh, two arms that come out of the dial now you want to show that this this is an anchor escapement and we see that the uh, mechanism is functioning rather nicely and uh, it makes a re really nice ticking sound. So uh, let us continue with this operation. Now, uh, I have very fortunately, very easily uh, moved the first, and this moved with no problem whatsoever. There is no rust here. Uh, so this was very e easy to do. Now, um, the main thing is being able to see where you're aiming there because we are talking about very small spaces. So I would like to align my screwdriver. Now visibility is the biggest challenge here. I did need to get very close to the movement and I was able to place the screwdriver down holding the top and uh, very uh, succinctly uh, turning to clockwise and it was very easy to turn this. This is a, a very high quality uh, caliber. Now uh, this would have been a luxury watch most likely it was in a golden uh, 
case. Uh, very often it's the fact that these movements surface once the gold has departed the scene. Uh, this is a um, very frequent situation, um, especially in scarce times where uh, people are pawning uh, these uh, precious metals. But now these are both ready to uh, flip this around and uh, we should be able to lift the dial. So that is the next step. So I have re uh, reversed this on the um, cradle and what I want to do is just very gently lift this dial. Okay. Oh, I do feel it is loose now. Okay, I do have the dial off. Now, we must look at this very closely. Now, I can already see on the back of the dial very light etching. This is excellent. This is exactly what I was expecting. This looks like 19,000, uh, three, seven, Two. Now these can be hard to read, these etchings, but we will look also at the surface of the dial, or movement rather. Okay, we do have the number. Twenty-two. Ah, oh, these are two. Those were twos. Twenty-two thousand. 378. Let's look at this again. Those are twos. 22378. Excellent. Both match. Uh, this will not be visible, but I will provide some uh, close ups. But this is very fortunate now because I can now go to a catalog. This is a very high quality. Uh, the, the, I must say this is a very high quality uh, movement. Uh, but I, I can now go to the catalog listing and insert this number, which I did not have before. And uh, it will, will be interesting to see where it ends up uh, versus the other objects. Because many objects are very, uh, very hard to date. Uh, they are generally guesstimated. And this is uh, usually within... A decade for example 1870 to 1880 uh, so we now have approximately 1869 1870 on the cusp of this period for this serial number so this is going to be very fascinating to see how it compares with the other objects so i will reassemble this and uh, uh, definitely um, present the catalog with the serial numberization so let us continue. So I've just uh, turned both these screws holding the dial feet uh, on and I've closed them so that the uh, crescent moon uh, or I should say gibbous it's the other way around but is closed and this is now secure so now I will flip this again and I will put the hands back on okay I um, have put the hands back on now I was amazed at the uh, time it took uh, for me to do this entire operation it uh, I have it uh, time-stamped at just under five minutes, so this is probably the best 
that I've ever been able to uh, achieve. However, uh, I have to say that this, uh, these pieces were um, not rusted. They were very easily um, handled, manipulated. Now, uh, this is a very beautiful, I believe this is an enamel dial, but it's, it's interesting that it almost feels porcelain. Uh, we do see that the, we, there are a myriad of these um, cracks, uh, lines running. Uh, obviously, it had taken some sort of damage over the years. Uh, the very beautiful hands. I believe this is blued steel, and these. I believe this is a very um, style of hand. If I'm not um, uh, mistaken, I believe that these are so-called Jurgensen style, and that would be very interesting because the movement is a Jurgensen style, Jules Jurgensen style movement. But uh, this would be a hand painted dial, and this would have been done by a. Cadurier, I believe it was called. Uh, Cadran, uh, 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 Cadran is the French word for dial. So, uh, but this was all handwork uh, before these photographic processes uh, uh, replaced this old art. So let us continue with the catalog and we will see where the serialization ends up. Uh, before I uh, proceed to the catalog, I would like to uh, check this to see that there is nothing wrong. Seems to be functioning admirably. Okay, that's satisfactory. Let us proceed. Of course, we must put this to rest. We have a series of various different Ebauches, uh, Jules Montandon, we have El Montandon, H. Montandon, both Locla, we do have Montandon Geneva, we have H. Montandon La Chaux de Fonds, Albert Montandon Geneva, uh, there is a Eugene Montandon, Locla, and a movement signed Fritz Montandon, Locla. Uh, this gives you an idea of the um, breadth and depth that this uh, family, and they're all related, they all share the same common ancestor. But you can get an idea of uh, a little bit about these pieces, uh, Montand and Locla also. So let us continue. Okay, so I apologize for the bad quality of the screen. I can also provide screenshots later. Now, I just wanted to show, this is a catalog that I have compiled of uh, approximately 445 uh, Montandon watches and clocks, mainly watches. Now, this is dating from object number one, which is very possibly as early as 1778, but certainly by 18, or 1789 rather. And this continues, now this is all Montandon makers. Uh, now, when we, look at, and, and then it goes to uh, the 1925, 1935 period is where the last watch, watch objects on this list are. Uh, and now let us go to these, this is a very interesting uh, discovery which has popped up in the stride of this investigation. So we are looking at Montanen for his Lokla and this piece, uh, now we find this piece, uh, it is object number 169 in this list. I have placed this uh, dating 1869. Now, uh, this uh, does appear to be the um, early, mid-1869. We do not know what the uh, case material is. It is suspected gold, but we do not know, so it is shaded. Uh, this is a key one, key set piece by Montana First Locla. And the description of the piece, we have this Jurgensen caliber movement with the patent dates, etc. Now, this is very fascinating because this piece is extremely close, extremely close in uh, serialization to, uh, and this is within 10 numbers, 22368. And uh, 22378 is this particular object. Now, 22368 was a uh, watch, which we do find uh, 
This was uh, part of a test at Yale University, which Montana Ferris was the only Swiss uh, participant. This is generally only American and British watches, but it competed in, in this 1881 Yale uh, uh, trial. Now, it is suspected, therefore, that the watch utilized in this piece was perhaps much older than this 1881 date. But clearly, we do have uh, other watches in this earlier uh, fitting in this 1868-1869 um, uh, period. And I do want to bring uh, attention to another object in this list. Now, Montandon Frere's Locla at this time was being uh, run by Charles Adolf Montandon. He was uh, known as Adolf Montandon Baroda or Charles Adolf. And we do find in the uh, objects by his fabrication, we do find a piece from 1868, which was a key wine, key set uh, piece in an uh, 18 karat gold uh, hunter case. And this was object 22345, and it was signed Charles Adolf Montandon Locla. That's very fascinating because that piece was a tourbillon. It was in a superb condition, it was auctioned. This was a 54 millimeter diameter, diameter piece, um, 188 grams of gold. But this is very interesting that this object is uh, very close in a serialization to a tourbillon. And we do find this 1868 date for that. Uh, this is a mere 30 uh, or so uh, in the serialization uh, earlier than the piece that we just examined. Uh, therefore, this would <laughs> very easily put it to that very early 1869 period. This is quite fascinating that we do have a very firm anchor for this uh, number of serialization. And once again, it must be remembered that these were sequential. These were sequential and these were part of their uh, invoicing. Uh, we, so we, we can expect that this uh, serialization uh, to have this chronological, at least in this series, chronological uh, order. So this is just a little bit of a research uh, video, and I'd like to present this to you. This is the uh, methodology I'm using in my research, and uh, this has uh, confirmed uh, very uh, significantly our dating. So uh, generally, when you see these objects for sale at auction, uh, auctioneers w will not be as bold unless they have some very firm historical data, etc. What we have here is more or less an indirect evidence uh, case study uh, with this regards, as we do have this ancillary data and we are able to compare with the other objects that uh, are known for the record. However, in this case, we do have additionally very strong evidence with the patent dates on the, on the two parts. So um, this is a very fascinating case study and I hope this was uh, uh, help uh, in your <laughs> own appreciation of this uh, magnificent brand. This is a brand that uh, uh, was uh, traces its founding in 1790. And uh, the, their, the, the original watchmakers' children established themselves in business in Paris, France in 1818. Uh, and they were there uh, basically until 1850 when they relocated fully to Locla. Now, during that time, they were also in Locla. They had fabrication facilities there. But um, this company was op uh, operating uh, from Locla also. We find it up until 1888, when the business was eventually uh, liquidated by the son of Charles Adolf, and that's Charles uh, Albert Montandon. And he uh, retired to the Caribbean where he established the largest cocoa plantation in all of the Caribbean. Uh, this had 100,000 cocoa plants. So it's a very interesting odyssey there. But this is just a little bit of a note for the record and thank you for your uh, attention, your comments, and your feedback. Have a nice day.